you know, it's, it, you gotta, it's, I don't know if people, like, realize that the fact that we're in a spiritual battle, I know we talk about that a lot, you know, many of us, you know, we might have different understandings of the, of the word and different, we're at different places in our walk, but, you know, every single thing that we face in life that comes against us and comes again, tries to prevent us from walking with the Lord or being closer to God, whether it's to understand His Word more, whether it's to be more, have a more of a worshipful heart or whatever, it's, it's the enemy, you know, that's coming against us and trying to cause confusion and, and you know, uh, going to the Lord and crying out, you know, to Him and spending time in His presence. I don't know if you if you do spend time in His presence, but I got to tell you that I was thinking while we were while we were worshiping, I'm always grateful for what God has done in my life and, and the things that He's shown me. And I can remember one time when I I had been married a few years and I was laying in the, in the bed in, in the bedroom in back living in a little video trailer, and and I was laying back there and I, I was thinking. Man, it was early, in, it was like late, either late at night or early, early in the morning. And I was thinking to myself, man, I, I, I need to get closer to God. I, I jumped up out that bed and I said, man, and you know, she was asleep, Danielle was asleep. And I said, I'm going to go in the living room and I'm about to get home to God. I only been knowing the Lord a couple of years. And you, when I tell you, I walked in that living room, I probably told this story before, and I knelt down and I was about to get, get doing business with God. All of a sudden, the spirit of fear jumped on me. I'm telling you right now, dude. I got straight up off of my knees. I walked back in my bedroom and I laid back up in my bed. And I never got up again for about 12 years. Wow. Never got up again for 12 years until I faced the tragedy of my sister's death. And then, out of a broken heart of sorrow and pain, I cried out to the Lord, man. I got right to the end of it. It took forever. But the Lord was like, son, come and find me early in the morning. Come and find me early in the morning. Seek me and you will find me. And after about three weeks of that, I got up early one morning. And I'm telling you right now, God showed up. And I realize now, I was just thinking, 12 years, you know, I mean, the Lord put it on my heart to get up and walk in that living room and to seek God. And for 12 years, I let that spirit of fear, that one time, that I was listening to God again, and I went back and I went my bed. And I'm just thinking to myself, that's a lying devil. I didn't understand spiritual things. Like people will talk about it all day long, but I really do not understand spiritual things. And I just want to encourage you that the devil will fight you tooth and nail to try to prevent you from getting closer to God. And all I can do is tell you, though, the experience that I had Whenever I began to seek God in my own house through worship, that's why I tell the musicians sometimes, if I can do what you do, I'm not doing that to, to make y'all feel weird. I'm just saying, like, I had to turn on this CD of some worship person, but whereas if I can sing and play a guitar or some kind of an instrument, I really feel like it just pleases the Lord, you know? For it's just to take the time to get into His presence. And it doesn't have to be with music. It doesn't, I don't think it has to be some kind of formula. You know, I was trying to turn it into a formula, but it's to get alone with the Lord and to cry out to God. And what I'm trying to tell you is, is that I want to, I want to remind you that you're in a spiritual battle. Yes. The enemy wants to destroy you. He wants to kill you. He wants to lie to you. And if you have certain things that you're dealing with, that you're going through in your life, you know, the only way to get freedom over a spiritual battle and a spiritual stronghold is for the Holy Spirit to show up, amen, and to bring the victory in your life. Praise God. Jesus already paid the price for you and I to be able to have the victory. But what we need is we need the Holy Spirit to do the work. Amen. Now, you know, real quick before, uh, well, we're going to go ahead and we're going to read this whole chapter. Amen. So let's go ahead and read. This is 2 Thessalonians chapter. Two. All right, we're going to start reading. It's got 17 verses. And it has to do, let me just tell you real quick, it has to do with the book of Revelation. It specifically has to do with the Antichrist. And this particular chapter, for me, gives the most powerful. You may not feel this way when I'm done with this teaching tonight, and that's okay. But this chapter, for me, gives the most powerful point on, the, on why... I don't any longer, I'm just going to say it like it is. We got, you know, uh, our brother, we, we appreciate you've been coming, but I want you to know, hey, listen, uh, 
But I, and I'm not trying to make anybody feel strange, because, but I just need to know, I just need you to know that as I've been teaching, I've been teaching the book of Revelation and the concept of the rapture from a little bit of a different position. But I want to always preface that by saying that the pe there's many people in my church that I believe still are holding to maybe a pre-tribulation rapture position, and it doesn't make, I don't lose sleep over it. I just want y'all to know. I think you should be studying to show yourself approved, but what I'm seeing in the scriptures is enough to make me come to you. Now, when this, when this study on Revelation is over, how often do you think we're going to talk about a uh, pre-trib versus a uh, Interseal midweek rapture. I mean, I don't think we're going to be doing it every Wednesday night. I mean, if the Lord puts it on our heart to talk about end time stuff, then we'll talk about it. But I want you to know that I believe it was so important that I devoted this much time to end time study. Okay, and when it's all said and done, many of you, you will know, you will know without the shadow of a doubt that, that at least there's some people that are seeing a different angle. And if it doesn't go down the way you always expected it to go down, and you don't you don't float away in a rapture before the man of sin is revealed, and that's what we're going to be talking about tonight, specifically the man of sin being revealed to the earth. And if it doesn't happen the way you were always taught, you ain't getting caught by surprise, my friend. And you, you may not even like what I'm going to say tonight. I don't personally like, I love the Word of God, but I don't like the concept that I may have to go through some stuff. Who wants to go through some stuff? Who wants to even go through simple stuff? Not too many people even want to go through simple stuff. But can I tell you, God's got a purpose for it. Why would, real quick, before we get into all this, why would God allow His church to go through a tribulous time or a, tribu a time of tribulation. Can, can, again, we're not talking about the wrath right of God. I'm asking you a question. I don't need you to raise your hand and answer. I'm going to answer it for you. But let me tell you why I believe God would allow. Because you see, listen, why does God allow you to go through times of tribulation today? <laughs> why does God allow you to go through valleys in your life? You answer that question. Come on, somebody say it. Strengthen you. Strengthen you. Strengthen you. Strengthen you. Test your faith. Try our faith. Yeah. Test our faith, right? What about to show us our heart? <laughs> what about to show us what's on the inside of us? When we walk around here all full of pride and spiritual superiority, I figured it out, and them poor people over there. Listen to me, friend. Listen to me, church. Half, half the time, we walk around here thinking more of ourselves than what we ought to. And let me tell you, if it's in you who love the Lord and have a revelation and understanding of God and His Word, what do you think the rest of this church is looking like? Oh, you know, we can become spiritually superior and say, yeah, but we're the remnant. And so the Lord's going to take us home. Let me tell you something. It would be almost selfish for us to think that way and to think that God does not love all. How many people do you think are out there that are struggling in their walk and their understanding about God's word, but genuinely love the Lord? How many people? You know they're out there. And, they, and listen, and they're sitting in other churches. And, and, this, and I'm not fussing about the other churches. I'm trying to make a point, and we'll get into it. I don't want to get ahead of myself. But how many people are sitting in other churches, and they're being pounded with false doctrine, and that their eyes have been glazed over by lying doctrines, and yet at the same time, they love the Lord. And then it comes back from a bride without a spot or wrinkle. And we sit here and we talk about the condition of the church left and right and how the church is in such a bad shape. And we wouldn't think that God would allow his own people called by his name to go through a purging of the whole. And people like yourself who know the Lord and understand and may be prepared. That for me personally, I'm just happy that I'm at least aware. That it may not go down the way that everybody always told me that it would. Okay? And we're going to get into this chapter tonight because for me, this chapter, I'm, I'm going to read to you out of the King James, but we're going to take a look at some different translations. For me, this chapter right here, it, it, ca it causes a major concern with the concept of the pre tribulation rapture. And I'm going to break it down for you the best way I know how tonight. All right? Here we go. Now we be see, now listen, let me just tell you this. The Apostle Paul is writing a letter. To the church in Thessalonica. Thessalonica is an area known as Asia Minor. It connects it, Israel's over here. It connects the, the, the east to the west. It was, it was a sliver of land where if you came up from Israel, 
and it ran, the Mediterranean Sea ran like a, almost like a bowl in it. Israel's over here. You could come up on foot. You could walk across Asia Minor. and you could make it all the way down to Greece, okay? All the churches in the book of Revelation were in scattered within this area known as Asia Minor. Thessalonica is over here near Greece, kind of closer to where we had preached the other day. I showed, I was going to show it to you on the map, but the, the, the stuff wasn't working, where the Apostle Paul left Thessalonica, then he went to Berea, then he ended up in Athens. And you remember we preached about Paul, seeing all those false gods. That's what we preached on Sunday. And so he's writing a letter to this church that's in the area known as Thessalonica. And they were undergoing major persecution. And they were being told that a letter had been written to them from the Apostle Paul that Jesus had already come back. That's what they were being told. And so the Apostle Paul's writing a letter to them, letting them know, hey, listen, I heard that you got this letter, but don't believe a letter because there's some things that have to happen before the rapture takes place. And he says that in this chapter specifically, some things that have to happen before the rapture takes place, and that's the context of what this chapter is saying. All right? So I just wanted you to know the context. All right? He's writing it to the church. So he says, now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him. Now, one thing that many people say is, is that this is talking about two different things. This is talking about the coming or the second coming of the Lord, and it's talking about the rapture of the church. It would be very difficult to say that this is not talking about the rapture of the church because it says, and by our gathering together unto him. You can't get away from that. That's talking about the rapture of the church. When we're all gathered unto the Lord. All right? That you be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter as from us. In other words, even if somebody sends you a letter, it says that the apostle Paul signed it. It ain't true because the Lord ain't come back yet. As that the day of Christ is at hand. Now, I want you to know that other translations use the day of the Lord. I think that's interesting. I don't know that we'll have time to, to cover that. Um, let's just keep going. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. Now, I want you to see. First of all, I want you to know that the majority of my message tonight is going to be on that simple phrase, falling away first. I'm going to probably, God only knows how much time I'm going to spend just talking about that one little three words, falling away first. I'm just letting you know the majority of my message is on that phrase. You ready? All right, here we go. And that man of sin be revealed. Who do you think he's talking about right there? The Antichrist. All right. The son of perdition. Who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worship, so that he as God sits in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. You know, Jesus used in Matthew chapter 24, he spoke of a time known as the abomination that causes desolation. He said, when you see the abomination that causes desolation that was spoken of by the prophet Daniel, take heed. If, the, if it's in the whole, pray that your flight be not taken in winter. And run to the hills. And Jesus warned of a time when, when the abomination that causes desolation was going to take place again. Yeah. Whenever I taught the book of Daniel, I beat y'all down for about four weeks with a man named Antiochus Epiphanes or Epiphanes. Y'all remember that name? I hope you at least remember the name. Come on, son. Amen. Help me out. How many times did I say Antiochus Epiphanes? Because that very kind of thing happened way back during the end of the Grecian Empire, well, really during the Roman Empire, where a man put a god up in the temple and tried to offer up swine on the altar, and he desecrated the altar, and he made them stop worshiping their god, they made them stop circumcising, and Jesus was saying, hey, you thought that was it? No, 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 that was just a type. The prophet Daniel was talking about another one that's coming, and right here it tells us he is going to sit in the temple, and he is going to demand to be worshipped as God. Hold on, church, because God only knows who's going to be around to see it, because to me, this chapter is saying that believers are going to see it. All right, here we go. 
showing himself that he is God. Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things. And now you know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. Before this night's over, I want to try to break down real quick withholdeth because I believe that that's also an important concept, okay? But now let's just keep going. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Let me just tell you, the easiest way for me to describe to you what the mystery of iniquity is, I would call it the spirit of antichrist. What else have I called it in some of these teachings? The spirit of battle, the spirit of Jezebel, the lying spirit of Satan, Satan and his work, all of the demonic spirits and fallen angels and the lies and the spirit of iniquity that, that causes people to be blinded to the truth of the gospel. Ultimately, what is planned the whole time is, yes, to blind people now, but ultimately it's to prevent people from being able to see when he pulls his, I think, I don't know if, it, I don't know if I'm saying it right, the coup, coup de gras, is that how Grandpa used to say that? Oh, how do you say that? The, the part of the chicken that went over the fence last, or whatever. I don't remember what it was called. It was. It, he said that's the coup, that something. It's the part of the chicken, whatever. It's the end. Is what it is. Okay. He's gonna pull. A, he's gonna pull a trick at the end. All right. He's, and in the midst of all of that, he's gonna pull his big reveal where he's going to, and and the world is gonna be confused, my friend. And much of the church is gonna be confused, my friend. And the last place you want. to is on earth when that happens and you ain't there. You hear? That's a big that's a big problem. But it already works. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken away. We really need to look at that in another translation, and we're going to try to do that before it's over, because that's one of the most confusing King James trained up versions, right? Verses right there, I'm telling you right now. But we'll look at it before it's over. And then shall that wicked be revealed. Whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Now, before we, before we move on, I want you to know that this word revealed, you probably can't see it on my little screen here. I just clicked on my, my Strong's and my King James. And the Greek word for revealed right here, I think this is important to understand, is the word apocalypto. Okay, so if I was going to, I'm just going to go ahead and write on the board. Sometimes I don't write on the board too much anymore. But this, this Greek word, the way that it's spelled, okay, if you, uh, apoc, I think I'm spelling it right, apoca, was it an O or an A? A, a apoca, I think this is how you write the L, I think, loop, 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 toe. Okay, all right, so. Alpha, Phi, Omicron, Chi, Alpha, Lambda, Upsilon, Tau, uh, Ypsilon, Tau, Omega. All right? Apocalypto. What does that sound like to you in English? Apocalypse. Apocalypse. So if you're going to write it, I think this is how you write it. Apocalypto. <laughs> you can write a Greek word or you can try, but you can't even write an English word. Apocalypse. All right? So the word apocalypse. And in the, in the book of Revelation, the word it, it, that is in the Greek is apocalypsis. That's the same root. Okay? That's what the word revelation means. Apocalypsis. The revealing. Okay? It's like something's been covered, and I know I've taught it already, and I'm not going to do it again because it's going to take time. But if I went and got that sheet over there, the drum thing, and I threw it over here, and I slow, I, when I ripped it off, or when I slowly peeled it back, I would slowly be revealing to you the pulpit, the TV, whatever you're looking at right now, I would be revealing it to you. I would be removing the cover that it previously kept hidden that which was there the whole time. The revelation of Jesus Christ, the whole thing, the curtain's going to be peeled back and the world is going to see Jesus for who he really is. Even if it don't happen until the very end because they're going to be deceiving the whole time. When Jesus comes back riding on a white horse, they're going to know, my friend. Okay? Israel's going to know. But look right here. Same thing. Not only is Jesus going to be revealed clearly, with all clarity, at some point in time, the man of sin is also going to be revealed. This isn't going to be questionable. This isn't going to be, oh, it's going to be revealed whenever I don't believe. That's why I wanted to take the time to show you this. Because if you think like me, then you're already thinking, yeah, but it could be whenever he gets that crown and he comes right in on that white horse. That could be when he's revealed. I believe that many of us will already know that he's being revealed at that moment in time. I believe that. 
But what I'm trying to tell you is, is that this word right here is the unveiling. It's going to be removed. The idea is, is that they will be able to see him for who he is. So I just want you to know I'm thinking too. Okay, I'm not just going into this line. All right, so he's, the wicked one's going to be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, shall destroy with the brightness of his coming, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan, with all power and signs and lying wonders. And with all the secretness of unrighteousness in them that perish. Because they received not the love of the truth that they might be saved. Isn't that sad? I mean, look. It's inevitable that self-righteousness will try to steal your heart. You understand what I'm talking about? How long you been saved? I mean, you don't need to all shout it out. But you already know that if you're honest with yourself, that at some point in time, when you got saved and the Lord started working in your heart, you became self-righteous. Yeah. You thought you was better than yeah. You prayed more than them. You lifted two hands instead of one hand. You did whatever you did. But guess what? Our hearts should hurt for the fact that, there's been, that there are people on the earth that had an opportunity to hear the gospel and to respond to the love of God the Father through Jesus Christ. And yet they received not the truth. And therefore they will be judged. They're going to perish. This world is wicked, my friend. Many of them love what they're called up here. All right. They receive not the, the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. Let me just, I didn't think about this earlier, when I, but, but let me just say this. If you've ever learned in the book of Romans, Romans chapter 1, you see another reason people don't like the apostle Paul is because Paul came in his homosexual. And so right now in the world right now, the easiest thing to do if you're a homosexual person and you feel, and you love God. I'm not trying to tell you that there aren't any homosexual people that don't feel like they love the Lord. There's a lot of adulterers that love God. There's a lot of fornicators. There's a lot of people connected to internet pornography that genuinely love God. But spirits of deception will try to convince you that you're still okay, that it's going to be Okay, and what I'm trying to tell you and what I'm trying to tell you, maybe you're out there and you're watching and maybe you feel like you're homosexual. I'm trying to tell you, no, it's a lie. It's a lie of deception. Yeah. Okay, well, Jesus never preached about homosexuality. Well, but what about Romans chapter 1? Yeah, but that's the Apostle Paul. Besides, a lot of people don't even feel like he really was a true disciple of the Lord. I'm trying to figure out anything that they can do to try to discredit the Word of God. Let me tell you something. Without the Apostle Paul, we in trouble, my friend. <laughs> we don't even understand justification by faith. We don't understand sanctification properly. We don't understand how God connected Jesus to the Old Testament. We are in a bind. You hear me? We don't understand victory. No, the Apostle Paul said it and he explained it to us in Romans chapter 1. But guess what? In Romans 1, they didn't want to acknowledge him as creator. Instead, they told to worship the creation. And so what did he do? He gave them over to a reprobate mind. And what does that mean? The wrath of God began to cloud and to darken their mind. And the Bible basically says that things got worse and worse. And worse, to the point where a woman burned out the woman and man burned out the man. It didn't even make sense anymore because it was against nature. You can't even procreate, which was what God told mankind to do. You took all of that out of the equation. That's the end result, my friend, of people that have given themselves over completely to sin. Is that, that, that it, it desecrates God's creation. I, I'm just telling you the truth. People don't want to hear that and say, oh, he's a hate monger. No, he's not a hate monger. He loves you enough to tell you what the Word of God says. You can't take Paul out of the Word of God. You can't take the book of Romans out of the Word of God. Without it, we don't have the whole Word of God. In a similar fashion right here, it says, and for this cause. What cause? Because they, loved, they did not love or receive the truth. For this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. That's what's going to happen to the inhabitants of the world in the end. That, that, that the delusion or the false doctrine and the, and the lie, lying teaching and the, and, the, and the false miracles that God is going to allow the Antichrist to perform is going to 
put people under strong delusion that they're going to be blinded. And i got to tell you something. People are blinded right now as we speak sitting in churches. And yes, this is at a whole other level. And I'm not trying to pick on nobody else's church or nobody else's preacher because I do care. Why do you care? You know, I had a guy tell me in Tampico's a few weeks back. But all you got to do, I might have even mentioned this to you. All you got to do is worry about your little flock. No, oh, dude, that's not what the Apostle Paul said, but that's the Apostle Paul. No! The Apostle Paul said, contend for the faith. Listen, when liars are coming into the church and they're changing the gospel and they're telling people what they want to hear with itchy ears and people buy into that, it puts them and prepares them for strong delusion. You need to understand the word of God, Christian. You need to understand your Jesus. You need to understand the work of what the Lord has done. Amen. That they're going to believe a lie. That the Lord's going to allow this to happen. Why? That they all might be damned who believe not the truth but have pleasure in unrighteousness. But we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God has from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth, whereunto he called you by our gospel to obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which you have been taught, whether by word or our epistle. Look, I didn't even notice this verse. Look at that. How powerful it is. Look at that. Therefore, brethren, stand fast and <laughs> get yourself in a position to stand. Stand, let's see what that word means. Right? To persevere, to stand firm, to persist. To keep one standing. To be stationary. <laughs> don't go backwards. Don't sit down. Don't crawl backwards like a crawfish. No. Take your stand. What? What am I supposed to say? Hold to the traditions which you have been taught. I'm telling you right now, all you got to do is open up this book and learn the book. And it's going to tell you that this whole world is in a world of hurting. And then all you got to do is start flipping through the channels and looking at the preachers on TV. And anything, for the love of God, you would be able to see the counterfeit that is being, that is being thrown out there and vomited out on the screen for people. And now people over there eating. Oh, Lord, forgive me. No, no, no. I'm telling you the truth. They're over there eating vomit and they're liking it. And can I, one of the things that I've noticed about people is that whenever they hear somebody talking like this, it, it offends them. It's like, who do you think you are? How dare you? You should only worry about your little flock. The whole church not in a mess. You know what? The Lord gave me this scripture and I wanted to show it to you tonight. Look at this right here. Jeremiah 5.31. Look, look, what, look what was going on in Jeremiah's day. You ready for this? A, a wonderful, he doesn't mean that in a good way. A wonderful, let's look at a different verb, translation. An appalling, this is the NASB, an appalling and horrible thing has happened in the land. Well, what is it, Jeremiah? Tell us. The prophets prophesy falsely, and the priests rule on their own authority. God's people, God's leaders that he called, are lying, and they're doing their own thing. And then it says, and my people love it so. <laughs> God's people were loving to be led around by a bunch of false prophets and by a bunch of lying priests. And can I tell you that it ain't a whole lot changed since the Old Testament? Amen. Can I tell you that they got a lot of lying prophets and a lot of priests that are doing their own thing that's contrary to the Word of God? And the people, bring it to New Testament, make for themselves piles of preachers because they have itchy ears. Now, do all of those people in churches, because I know Brendan and I had a little text conversation the other day, and he was like, but do you think that all them people, don't they love God? Absolutely. How many people do you think love the Lord and genuinely want to know God and have found themselves caught up in a mess? But what I need you to see is this, is that the same spirit that was alive then is still alive today. That's what kind of gets me. I, I need to get into this. Second Thessalonians. But that's what kind of gets me. That's the part that I... Do you think that the devil took a nap? <laughs> no, really. I mean, that, let me ask the old Matt 12, 20 years ago. Matt, did, were you thinking that the devil was taking a nap? When you were so confused and blinded in your own eyes, 
You thought the devil went away because like things got better and smarter and technology increased and no, he didn't take a nap. He's working in the midst of all of it. He was behind much of it to create further levels of deception to make it even more difficult for people to see. That's what he does. All right. All right. Anyway, let's go back to the King James right here. And let's go back to our passage of scripture, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And I guess we're around verse 15. Therefore, brethren, stand fast, hold the traditions which you have been taught, whether by word or by our epistle, which is another word for letter, which is this that we're reading. It's an epistle. It's a letter. Now, our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God, even our Father, which have loved us and has given us everlasting consolation and good hope through grace, comfort your hearts and establish you in every good word and work. All right. Now. Let's go ahead and go. I got my little thing working today, and I want to try to, I want to try to, um, to help you to see. I'm hoping I'll help you to see some things. All right. So look, <clears throat> let no man deceive you by any means, for that day, that day shall not come except there come a falling away first, and the man of sin would be revealed, the son of perdition. All right, now I want to kind of take a look at this concept of falling away. This is the Greek word. The word apocalypse up there. The Greek word is up there. Apostasia. All right? So we need to understand what does this word mean. We need to understand how is this word used. So I'm going to take you on a little bit of a journey, and I hope that when it's all said and done, you're going to understand how this word has been used. Okay? I'm making a big point about this. Let me tell you why I'm making a big point about this. Because people, I'm just going to say it like it is, people that I respect, that have done commentary on the book of Revelation have said that this word, this falling away phrase should have been translated as catching away. Okay? So that completely changes the whole picture of the chapter. That if you change a falling away to a catching away, now what you're saying is, that before the day of the Lord or the day of Christ and our gathering together to him comes, a great catching away must take place. So now you have, in the word of God, if you've changed it, you have the idea that before the, but that, that, well, that, how, I just thought about that. How confusing is that? So before the rapture, the rapture has to take place? <laughs> wow. Okay, that's another, I'm not trying to make fun, I'm just trying to chill. That's what, that's what they're, that's what they're saying. So, but when you change it, though, see, what they really, what, what's really been that, and the person that I'm talking about ain't the one that wrote that originally. This is just, this is just bringing it back from other people that had written it in the past to hold true to the pre-tribulation position. Right. All right. So, when you call it a catching away, now you're saying that the rapture is going to take place before the Antichrist is revealed. Right. So you ain't got to worry about that, church. You don't have to worry about seeing the Antichrist because. You can already be The great catching away will take place. So what I'm trying to tell you tonight, my whole main purpose, I probably could have just said it. Apostasy don't mean that. Apostasy don't mean catching away. But no, instead what I'm going to do is I'm going to go overboard in proving to you that that's not what it means. Because I'm going to put this, I'm going to put this right here to rest. And this is, this is a problem text for pre-tribulation. I just want you to understand. All right, so here's the word, apostasia. Look what it means. It, the, the strict definition of it in the Strong's Greek Dictionary says a falling away or to forsake. All right? Look, what, look at this word. A defection is where we get our word apostasy. Now, one of the reasons that I gave you the Jeremiah passage is because I wanted to make this point to you that the same spirit that was alive during the time frame of Jeremiah is alive today. And that I will agree with you that there's a great apostasy that's already taking place today. And that I will tell you that a great portion of apostasy is some of the stuff that we see on Christian television. Some of the lies that are propagated from the pulpit. Okay, but what this is talking about is there's coming a day when there's going to be a great falling away. Now, I want you to just imagine in your smart minds for just a second. I don't mean that lightly. A lot of you people I respect because I know you're very intelligent and you study the scripture. But I want you to understand this, is that what a better way than, what do you think would happen, and I've already asked this question before, 
If all of your life you thought you would never see the man of sin, you thought you would never have to deal with the mark of the beast, and then all of a sudden, you're faced with the situation that you've got to make a choice. And you never would have dreamed in a million years that you ever had to prepare for anything like that. What do you think would happen? What do you think would happen to Christians that began to realize that one of two things, I believe, the people that weren't prepared. Now, you can say, oh, no, but if the Spirit, I know that the Lord knows how to take care of what belongs to Him. I know that. And, and, and but I guarantee you, one thing is going to definitely weed out the wheat from the tares. Yeah. It's definitely, that would definitely weed out the wheat from the tares. Yeah, but it'd be easier just to take the wheat away and leave the tares here. Yeah, that's what we'd all like. Wouldn't we all like that? You know, before the man sins, that would reveal, just take it out of here, Lord. Wouldn't that be a better, easier thing to preach? You know, it's a whole lot easier to preach that. Lord, get me out of here. Give me an escape. I like that word escape. Even my one of my favorite preachers used to say, that, escape, escape, escape. I love the word escape. Escape. Amen. This morning, Larson used to say, that, talking about something different, talking about trial and tribulation. That's what we like. We like to hear escape. All right. This word means a falling away and a forsaking. What's going to happen whenever people realize if it does go down the way that I'm trying to tell you that I'm concerned that it's going to go down, what's going to happen when people weren't prepared in their heart and like all of a sudden they're faced with this very thing. How dare you, God? Don't tell me that they won't do it. Because I see people won't do it that love God. But, and they ain't even really going through nothing that bad. They want to shake their fist in the face of God and blame Him. Yeah. Never would they be willing to look at their own self. Lord, help no. So it's a defection, it's a falling away. I'm here to tell you that we're already seeing a falling away in the church as a whole because we've moved away from the truth of the gospel. And yes, I have to tell you, yes. this is going to be a big one. And it's up ahead. When it comes, I don't know. I'm just letting you know that it's coming. Now I wanted you to see a couple of different translations of the way they word it. So we already looked at the King James Version and it says falling away. Here right here is the ESV. Look at this word. This Now these are translators, okay? Now what, why, why are you showing me different translations? Well, while I don't always agree with every translator, what I have to tell you is that they, they're a whole lot smarter than me. Does that mean that they got it right? No, it doesn't. Because some of them don't mean they be led by the Holy Spirit. But they understand how to read the Greek language, not like just a little bit. They don't do like I do and click on my strongest Greek concordance and give you a definition. They don't get up there and write a couple of little Greek letters trying to impress everybody. They can read this stuff. They understand the suffixes that are put on the word, and they understand that it's past tense, or that it's present perfected, or that it's a participle, that it's a verb. They understand the language, dude. They can read it. And whenever they, this guy that helped translate the ESV he called it a rebellion, it's because that's what the word means. It means a falling away or a rebellion. Or it can mean... Here's another one, the NASB. Let no one in any way deceive you, for it will not come unless the apostasy, I love that word, unless the apostasy comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction. So I wanted you to see right here before we move to the next slide, what is it? We've already talked about it, but it will not come unless, one, the apostasy comes first and two. The man of sin is revealed. Now, I want you to understand what we're saying here. If the interpretation of this verse is right, that means that two things have to happen before the rapture of the church. Number one, the apostasy has to come. Number two, or the great falling away. Number two, the man of lawlessness <coughs> is revealed. Period. Done deal. That's what it means. Okay, so you chew on that for a while. All right. Let no one in any way deceive you, for it will not come unless the apostasy comes first and the man of sin or the man of lawlessness is revealed, which is the son of destruction. So I wanted you to see, again, we're focusing right now on this word, it. What's not going to come? Well, the, the coming of our Lord. The coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together with him. So it, the coming of our Lord, will, that's the context of what we're reading. I know I'm not going overboard, but I want you to see it. It will not come. What will not come? The coming of our Lord. Here's another scripture. This is the direct context right here. Look. Oh, Lord. Here we go. 
Here we go with his technology. All right. <laughs> Look here. All right. This is what I want you to see. All right. Now we request the, the coming of our Lord. Boom. Get rid of that one. Bring another one in here. Look. Here it is. It, it will not come. Look. As from a, that the day of Christ is at hand. I wanted you to see that. The coming of our Lord, the more specific context is verse 2. It, what is it? The day of Christ. Okay? The day of the Lord. Now, I'm trying to make a point because this is where some people will come in. And I'm, giving, I'm being fair. I'm, I'm not trying to hide nothing. I'm being fair. This is where some people will come in and say, yeah, this is talking about the day of the Lamb. This is talking about the, the rise of the Lamb. This is talking about the second coming of Jesus. What I need you to understand is I've already pointed this out before whenever I do my little, did my little graphs. I personally believe that the day of the Lord that Joel spoke of is when the sun turns dark, the moon turns to blood, the earth will quake. And what I'm trying to tell you is, is this, is that that is seal number five. And I've already said that the rapture takes place between seal number six, or at least that's what I'm seeing, and seal number seven. And so I've also said this before, too, that it seems as though to me that the day of the Lord is actually the beginning of when the wrath of God is that's about right. to be poured out. And that that's when God's pulling his people out of here. And that I'm not trying to tell you that it happens exactly the same day, but that the day of the Lord, when the sun is darkened and the moon turns to blood, is possibly happening either on the same day or right there in conjunction with the rapture. And I've already used the point to, to say, spiritually speaking, that the reason that I can say that is, is that it's intricate. Is that I go back to times in the Bible where it says on the day that, saw, that Lot left Sodom, what happened? God poured down fire and brimstone on the day that Noah entered the ark. The rain fell and the earth broke up. What are you trying to say? The rescue of God's people on the same day as the wrath of God was poured out. Does that prove it? No. <laughs> it's pretty, some pretty good scriptural context that's biblical and not just a man's opinion. That's all I'm trying to say. All right? So, look, Jesus already talked about a falling away. It's not the same word in the Greek, so I don't want to lead you to believe that. But look what he says. At that time, many will fall away and will betray one another and hate one another. That's a falling away, my friend. It goes on to say that mother will turn against their own children and brothers against sisters, their family members. You know? Look, many false prophets will arise and will mislead many. All right, now, listen. This word right here, Septuagint. Anybody knows what the Septuagint is or the Septuagint? You ever heard of that before? Some of y'all have. Go oh, ahead. Yeah. Somebody at least raise your hand. Because thank you, guys. Thank you, Thank you, Thank you, All right, now, some of y'all know. Y'all just don't want to raise your hand. Listen. What is the Septuagint? What do you need to know <laughs> for this purpose tonight? You ready? This is the Septuagint. It's a Greek translation of the Old Testament. Wow. What does that mean? Okay. You got it. How many English translations do you know? King James Version, NASB, ESV, NIV, the Holman translation. You know, translation, those are all English translations. You ever been to Brother Swagger's bookstore? How many translations do they got over there? They got one in Mandarin Chinese. They got one in Spanish. Guess what? Danielle, this is cool. When I first met Danielle, she was supporting this little girl named Anna Paula through Compassion International. And the girl has continued to live for the Lord. Now, Danielle wasn't just sending her checks. I mean, you know, she was writing her letters and she was telling her about the Lord. Well, this girl says, do contact with her through social media. She said, I just want you to know, I get a translator to come over here and I watch, I watch Matt on video. And I get a translator to come over here. And one day Danielle was like, what? And she, and she told Danielle that they speak Portuguese. I said, I think that brother Sorry got a translation in Portuguese. So sure enough, we went to the bookstore and it's the green cover. So that's what I'm trying to say. That's a Portugal a translation of the Bible. You got Spanish translations, Vietnamese You get the point? The Septuagint was a Greek translation of the Old Testament. Why would they do such a thing? Because Alexander had conquered the whole known world and the lingua franca, what does that mean? The tongue of the time, what everybody was speaking was Greek. Everybody spoke Greek. Everybody read Greek. Even Jewish people. It's kind of like Cajun. Yeah, you know, you know, your, your, your mammy and your pappy used to speak French. Some of y'all people still do. But, but, but for 
for people like me. My mama can't speak French, but her mom and daddy spoke fluent French. Alright? So it wasn't that long ago that the people around here spoke French. But guess what happens is, is that as time changes and a new language comes in and they force people to start speaking that language and they make other people quit speaking that other language, guess what happens? Everybody forgets the language, especially the last 400 years. They forget the language that they used to speak. Now they speak a new language. So not even Jews, half of them can't even speak Hebrew. That's why they time to read the book of Acts and the apostle Paul motions with his hand and he starts to speak in Hebrew to the crowd. They all like... Whoa, dude, this guy speaks Hebrew. <laughs> yeah, because he's legit. He speaks Hebrew, he speaks Greek, he speaks Aramaic, he speaks all kinds of stuff. He's trying to talk to you. He don't even want these Greek people to know what he's trying to tell you. Okay? Maybe. I don't know. But the point is, look, a Greek translation of the Old Testament. Listen, this is the translation that was read by the Jews at the time of Jesus. You, you, know, you know what I'm trying to say? Because everybody spoke Greek. So... What we're talking about is books like Genesis and Exodus and Leviticus and Deuteronomy and the prophets, Joshua, Isaiah, Jeremiah, come out of the Old Testament. The New Testament is written in Greek. The Old Testament was written in Hebrew. This is a Greek translation that took the Hebrew and translated it to Greek. You're with me now, right? I just want to make sure we're on the same page. This can also show us how specific words were used. Now, for your benefit, I happen to have a Septuagint in my, in my iPad. All right? This is Joshua 22, 22. I just copied it. They're nice enough to show us the name in English. Joshua 22, 22. You see the word in blue? You might not be able to make it out, but what is it? It's apostasy. So this is how they used the word in this verse. In the time of Jesus, really before the time of Jesus, this is what they thought about the word apostasy in ancient Greek when they used it to translate the Hebrew scriptures. I hope y'all are still with me. Okay, this isn't that difficult, right? Okay, here we go. Here it is in English. The rebellion. There you go. That's how they use the word. Not a catching away, but a falling away, right? Here's another one. Jeremiah 2.19, apostasy, a boom, backslide. Thine own wickedness shall correct thee, and thy backslidings shall reprove thee. So what is my point? This is my point. The main point is that in no way that I can find is it appropriate to translate the falling away as anything other than falling away, rebellion, apostasy, or backsliding, but definitely not catching away as the middle is the rapture. I'm about to close. All right? So... Verse 4 of the chapter that we read talks about the fact that he will exalt himself. I want you to know that the Antichrist is going to come upon the earth. He's going to exalt himself. He's going to demand to be worshipped as God. These are a couple of other points that I felt like were important to point out in the chapter before we close tonight's service. So he's going to exalt himself. We're going to go back to the passage of Scripture and we're going to read some of this because in a different translation because I want you to understand this a little bit better. Verses 6 through 8. What restrains him at? Remember that word that I used in King James? And when I read it in King James, it says withholdeth. And another word that's used is let. Let. L-E-T-T-E-T-H. We don't even use that word. Like that. So we need to look at it in another translation. But the idea is what is restraining him? Many people believe it's the church. And that once the church is removed, then the Antichrist will be revealed. Okay. All, I, all I'm going to say is this. And, and, and it, all, this, is just, this is just illogical. Because I don't know that we're ever going to be able to tell you without a shadow of a doubt exactly who it is that's restraining the Antichrist from coming out now. I mean, I have my opinion, but you may not agree with my opinion. Okay. Um, but I can say, I think that we can all agree on this, that when we look at the condition of the church, that the church has not really done its job too much better than what Israel did in the Old Testament. So I don't see how the church itself is restrained. Now, if you want to say a connection of the church to the Holy Spirit, then I can buy into that some because it's the Holy Spirit that some people have said the Archangel Michael. I don't. I don't believe that. And that's just some, because it's other passages out of Daniel that they bring in there, and there's other reasons that they bring that out. 
I'm not trying to sit here and get in an argument about that. I'm just trying to say, listen, this is my take on that. The, the book of Jude said this. Even the archangel Michael dare not bring a rattling accusation against Satan, but he says the Lord rebuked it. So even if it was the archangel Michael, he ain't doing it by himself. It's the Lord doing it, right? It's all, and so my, my take on it is that it's the Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit on earth that restrains him or prevents him. And we'll look at some of those scriptures. Okay, but look. The activity of Satan with all power and signs and false wonders. And the last thing I want you to know before we close tonight is that God has chosen you. Amen. So let's take a look at a couple of these little spots. We'll look at, uh, uh, let's, let's take a look at, well, I didn't mean to get off of there. So let's look at let's look at Thess Second Thessalonians chapter. Well, what I wanted to really do, I don't want to go back to to this this scripture right here, verses six through eight. Second Thessalonians two, verses six through eight. All right. And I wanted to go to a different translation. Let's just use the NASB. I like that. So look look at the words. Words. And you know what restrains him now, so that in his time he will be revealed. And we talked about the word revealed and how it's descriptive of apocalypse. Now listen, a strong the reason why I'm pointing this out is, is because number one, this is an important thing for you to try to wrap your mind around the best that you can. I'll do the best that I can to try to teach it what I see here. But the, pre, the, the pure pre-tribulation stance says that it's the church that's restraining him. And then that now coincides with translating apostasia as catching away instead of falling away. And so that now that the rapture has taken place and the catching away has taken place, and now the, the church is gone, and so now the Antichrist can be revealed. Yeah, yeah, does that make sense what I'm trying to say? So many people in the pre-tribulational stance believe that this is talking about the church, that that you know what restrains him now at the church is what they would say. I'm saying it's the Holy Spirit. And I'm saying that, it, that, it, that it's the Holy Spirit that restrains him until the Holy Spirit's ready to let him until, until God gives him the crown. First seal, number one, white horse, right on a white horse, the counterfeit. Give it a crown. Until God says it's time for you to have your crown, you don't get revealed. That's what I say the Holy Spirit is doing. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains, look, the reason that I want you to see this is because you might read the King James, and I love the King James, y'all know that. But look what the King James uses for that word right there. Now, this is confusing when you read it in Old English. Yeah. Now, he who letteth will let. What, what, are you, what are you talking about? Okay? Because we don't use that word like so only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. And so what I imagine is, okay, forgive me those of you that are watching on video, but what I would imagine is is that this is what's going on. So the Holy Spirit saying, you can't apocalypto yet. And people may be watching the video, or but if they are watching the video, they're probably not kind of it. But you can't you can't see who he is yet. Okay? But when I'm ready for you to see who he is, when I'm ready to give him this crown, when I'm ready for everybody to see, the reveal is case. Only you who now letteth will let until he says something different. Only he who now restrains, who's big enough to have the hands to remove the veil? Not, not standing at the river, rat. Right? Not, not little preacher in South Louisiana. No, I can remove this veil with a hand. No, it's the Holy Ghost. That's what I say. Now, I'm going to say it just because I say it loud and make the veins pop out of my head. Don't make it right. But what I'm saying is I'm convinced there's only one that has the power to reveal. There's only one that has the power to say, this is when you get your crown. This is whenever we reveal to the world who you are. It's in my timing. It's when I say so. It's like the prophet Daniel said that that which is written must come to pass. It's going to happen when God says Amen. it's going to happen. And when, who opens the first seal? Jesus. Jesus. Yeah. 
and when Jesus opens the first seal. So what I'm saying is whatever God is ready for the timing to take place. It doesn't, in other words, what I'm trying to say is it doesn't have to be the rapture of the church for all this to take place. We don't have to stick to that. If you want to stick to that position, stick to it. If you want to hold on to it, hold on to it. What I'm saying is I don't need the rapture of the church to fulfill this. I just need the Holy Spirit to say, okay, I'm removing the blinders now. Now it's time. That's all I need the Holy Spirit to do. According, and, the, and the Word of God is intact in Amen. All right. So he who now restrains, who's he? Well, Lord, help us figure it out one day. Amen. Will do so until he is taken out of the way. Now, listen, this is pure speculation. I have no way to prove this. This is part of the reason that I believe is going to be a little bit different during the time frame after. Uh, let's just, this, uh, listen, whenever I brought, broke down Daniel and I brought in that 75 day time frame out of Daniel chapter 12 and I said that that was the time of great tribulation, we're only talking a month and a half or something like that, or two months or whatever 75 days is, a little bit more than two months of a time frame where the, if this is a right interpretation and the, and the rapture takes place between seal number six and seal number seven, we're only talking about a 75 day period that that passage out of Daniel chapter 12 is right, a great tribulation before the rapture of the church takes place. Okay. But at the same time, um, you know, he who now restrains will do so until he's taken out of the way. And so what that would mean is, I know that I'm giving you a lot of information, but what that would mean is, is if all those numbers are right, if they are, okay, then what's going to happen is, is that the, when the Holy Spirit allows, when that, that seal's already been opened, but when he's really revealed is when he elevates himself in the temple and he says, worship me, I'm God. And now the veil is removed. And now he's revealed to the world for who he really is. And now there's this short period of great tribulation that the world has never seen. And if it was not cut short, even the elect would be deceived. Mm -hmm. And after that 75 day period that we get from Daniel chapter 12, the rapture of the church takes place. Seal number six is taking place. The rapture of the church takes place. Then that lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will slay. <laughs> with the breath of his mouth and bring to an end by the appearance of his coming. Alright, let's go ahead and close with this because I got good news. I want to finish it with good news, church. Amen. And it goes on to say, we've already read it, it goes on to say this, it says that, um, that the reason that <laughs> those people will be deceived is why? Because they didn't love the truth. And so God will allow them to be deceived. Some people would say, oh, well, you serve a harsh God. No, really, he's just giving people what they want, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. I mean, if you think about it, it's like he gave you a free will, and then and he gave us his word. Yeah. Dude, I've been talking to people at work like crazy. And I'm like, all I know is this. This is what I believe. You call me crazy? <coughs> call me whatever you want to call me. This Bible that he gave us is how he has chosen to communicate with us. I believe it. I'm sold out to it. You think I'm crazy. It's okay. I'm sold out to the Word of God is what God wants mankind to know. And that this little vapor that you got called life, it was all for one purpose. It was to make a decision of what you're going to do with God and whether you will receive His Son. And listen, when you read the Bible from cover to cover, you learn real quick <coughs> that that is exactly like what I used to do. Listen to me. It's not about it's not about being the best nurse practitioner, about being the best doctor, about being the best mama, about being the best husband. Yeah, we need to work, Lord help us all. <coughs> about being the, I see all these music, about being the best music, musician, about being the best scripture thrower up on the screen. It's not about that. Yeah, we want to excel at everything that we do. You know why you want to work hard? You want to know why you, it's good to be the first one there and the last one to leave. You know what? It's like, well, even my daddy didn't have much right, but he told me this. He said, let me tell you something, boy. When you start working, and you want to know it's all them other boys in the whole film. If I get you this job, you got my, you got your daddy's name. So let me tell you something. Whenever the work starts getting hard, you're going to see what they're going to do. They're going to start ducking out around the corner and they're going to start hiding. Don't you hide from the work, boy. When they run from it, you need to run too. What I'm trying to tell you is this. It's a bad witness when you're talking about Jesus and you're shirking your responsibilities. It's a bad witness for Jesus when you're the one 
calling in, and now everything's got to shut down. I'm going to tell it to you like it is. It's a bad witness for Jesus whenever you call in, and everybody else, now look, if you got 103 fever and you got COVID pneumonia, come on, man, cut me some slack, Jack. I'm trying to make a point. It's a bad witness. Whenever you don't show up to work and you're the same one that's been talking about Jesus. And I, know, I guarantee you right now, you got some people that work harder than the Christian. That ought to not be the case. We ought to be the most... Anyway, let me not get on. <coughs> All over the world, let me hear you. We should always give thanks to God for you, brethren, beloved by the Lord, because God has chosen you from the beginning. I want you to see that. He chose you. Yes. <laughs> now listen. I don't believe this is like with the Baptists. The Baptists believe in predestination. They believe any, many, mighty, go catch a sinner by the toe. Look at Mike, boy. I knew that the Lord had his hand on Mike. There you go right there. That's not what it's saying. He chose you in Christ. See, from the beginning of time, God had a plan. In the, in the garden, he told him, he said, the seed of the woman will crush your head, you lion serpent. He, God, has been very methodical in bringing it through, right? He creates a sacrifice for the first couple. He creates a sacrifice for the ends of his family. He creates a sacrifice on the Day of Atonement for the whole nation. Then he gives us Jesus. God's plan has always been the same. I have chosen you out in him. <clears throat> How do you do such a thing? Because I created a plan. And the only way you're going to really meet with me is if you come my way and not your own way. And how do you go the way of the Lord? Somebody tells you the good news of the gospel. That's why the Lord wants you and you and you and you and you and me to live Jesus in public. Not the way that Matt does it. I know I keep saying that, but I'm just trying to make sure y'all understand and get that. Because for the longest time, I didn't understand that. And I was so apprehensive. And I was trying to do it the way Sister Tut was doing it. And guess what? There ain't no other Sister Tut. Okay? But guess what? I don't need to be Sister Tut. He already had one of them. I need to be mad. And guess what? Rich ain't going to look like Matt. Rich is going to be, it's going to, I can tell you right now. He's probably already talking to people about Jesus. But listen, when he gets in a conversation with Je about Jesus, it's going to be a lot different than the way it looks whenever Matt gets in a conversation. But the point is, is that people are talking about Jesus. Man. You understand? Seeds are being planted. The truth of the gospel is being planted. That's what we're here for. And so this is the plan. That God has brought about this plan. He called Abraham out from his father's house and he made a great nation out of him. And through that nation, he gave the world Jesus. And then Jesus died on the cross and he paid the, the sin penalty for the whole world. And now when that truth is spoken about Jesus and the cross, guess what happens? The Holy Spirit is hovering over the heart of people and he's causing stuff to happen in their heart. And they're like, oh my God, I don't think I'm about to... <laughs> I just talked to... <laughs> Some guy the other day, I love his testimony. He's a drummer, and, and he's been living for the Lord for a long time. And one night, he was he was at his friend's house, and they, they were in a, a rock band. <clears throat> they were smoking pot, and the guy is sitting there. He said he he said this dude was trying to scare me. Well, guess what? Have he not tried to scare you? I'm just trying to say you might watch one day, and I'm I'm trying to say you can affect that dude. <laughs> he might have been stoned out of his mind, and he might have been trying to to. Scare you, but he was talking about Jesus. I, am I promoting that everybody goes smoke dope? And, no, because then you start thinking you're okay. I know plenty of people that sit there and they get in this little circle and they smoke and go, Well, man, you know, no, 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 that's not the Lord's will. But nevertheless, the word of the Lord went forth, and all of a sudden that dude stood up. I love this testimony. He's been serving Jesus for 30 years now or longer. He stood up, and I, every time I see him, if he ever shows up over here, if I remember him calling me all off, I'd say, hey, tell him your testimony. And, he, and this is how simple it was. He got up, and he said, where are you going? He said, I think I'm going to be religious. And he walked out the house, and he never went back. He didn't even know what that meant. He walked up out the house, and he ain't never went back to that place again. And he said, I think I'm going to be religious. And now he knows, but he's like, he got saved. Jesus changed his heart. Amen. So listen, the plan of God is never going to change. And listen, God has chosen you in that plan from the beginning for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and faith in the truth. You see, you can't separate the truth. You can't separate faith in the truth. 
truth, the truth of Jesus Christ and Him crucified from the working of the Holy Spirit. And let me tell you what happened. You know what that word sanctification means? If I was going to click on it, this is the ending of me, so I can't do it. If I was going to click on it, it would tell you to be made holy, to be made separate. Do you understand that when you got saved, God made you holy? <laughs> Not because you did it right all the time. Come on, friend. Come on, God. It's all what what up there. Listen, no. You know what it is? It's because you accepted the plan that was in place from the beginning. Good. You heard the good news of the gospel and you said yes to Jesus. And God the Father clothed you in the righteousness of Jesus. And he set you apart. He said, you ain't no longer part of this over here. You're now part of this right here. You need to get up and walk out and say, I think I'm going to be religious. I'll see you guys later and move on to the place of separation that God has called you amen. to be. Amen. Yes. It's a plan that's from the beginning, amen. Oh, and it's amazing. a miracle that happens in the heart. Okay. If you don't know if you've even experienced it again, you know what Sister Took told me one time, Father? She said, Son, you can keep coming up. Some people will tell you not to come up to this all because you've been up here every service for the last 20 services. But she said, you know what, son? No, you just keep coming up to the altar every time you think you need to get saved. You don't need to get saved but one time. But guess what? If the Lord's telling on your heart and he's telling you to come up here, keep on coming. Keep your heart soft with Jesus. If you're not sure if you're saved today, accept him right now. Say, Lord Jesus, I want to be saved. Come into my heart. Forgive me of my sin. Amen. And lead me and guide me in truth. Praise God. Father, we thank you. We thank you for your truth. We thank you for this gospel message that tells us what it means to be born again. Thank you, Lord, for dying on the cross for our sin and for paying the penalty of our sin. Holy Spirit, move on our hearts, O Lord God. Move on people's hearts that might watch this video. Move on our hearts in here, Lord. Lord, we invite you into our hearts right now, Lord God, because we want to be saved. We want to serve you. We want to be born again. Holy Spirit, lead and guide us in truth. Teach us your ways. Make us more hungry for the things of God. Use us, Lord, as witnesses. Fill us up with your Holy Spirit. Baptize us in your Holy Spirit, oh Lord God. Make us witnesses for you, Lord, so that we can be pleasing to you, that we will be about our Father's business. We want to thank you, Lord. We close tonight thanking you, Lord Jesus, for your obedience.